This morning, I'm going to start a series on worship called Flammable. And, and it's really more specifically our role in worship. And I don't know how far I'm going to get. I, 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 I didn't get as far as I thought. I wrote out more sermon than we had time for. But there was a family in East Indiana, <clears throat> mother, father, two children, who traveled to Indianapolis. And they uh, were going to go to a hotel. And the father dropped the, the, the uh, mother and two children off in front of the hotel. And the mother and, and two children went into the hotel. And they got in, and it was a beautiful hotel. They looked at it. But when they got in, they heard this ding. And, there, and, and a little time went by, ding. And they were like, what is that? What is that? So they started hunting for it, and they went toward it. And they, they got to, uh, they heard it again, and it was right there. And it ding. And the wall opened up. The mother was like, what is, what is this? And then, ding, the wall opened up, and people went into the wall, and the wall shut. And then new people came out when it opened. Finally, this old man comes up, and he's, he's walking down, and he stands in front of the wall. He has a cane. He walks into the wall when it opens, and it closes. And when it opened, this good-looking, studly young man walks out. And the mother looks down at the kids and says, Kids, go get your father. That's all I got. That's all I got. <laughs> Perspective matters. Perspective matters, doesn't it? My goal today is just to try to shift your perspective about worship just a little bit. Because how we see a thing shapes the way we think about it and we interact with it. When, when we have limited information about a subject, we begin to make up in our minds what we fill in the gaps and we come up with our own conclusions about what it is. We know a little bit about what's happening, but with limited information, we start coming up with our own thinking about it. This is called perspective. And I remember one of my seminary professors telling telling us in class that your perspective always depends on where you are standing, where you're looking at a thing and how you're looking at it. And when it comes to worship, most of us have limited knowledge as to what worship really is. And it's evidenced by uh, a person, uh, George Barna is a researcher, and he wrote in his study called Experiencing God in Worship, he wrote this. He said, most adults will contend that a Christian has the responsibility to worship God. Most of us will contend that. However, when asked to define what worship is, two out of three adults are unable to offer an appropriate definition or description. He goes on to say this, even among those who consistently attend Christian worship services, the majority do not consider worship a top priority in their life. It may not necessarily be, need to be a top priority, but most do not even include it among a laundry list of top priorities. Let me break that down a second. What that means is that in, in this room right here, we've gathered for worship. That most of us, if we were asked the question, what do you do in your life to honor God? Most would never even mention worship. Barna goes on to say, most of the motivation among young 
among adult Americans today for attending worship is to please and satisfy themselves, not to honor and please God. A.W. Tozer said, for large sections of the church, the art of worship has been lost entirely. And in its place has come this strange and foreign thing called the program. This word has been borrowed from the stage and has been applied with sad wisdom to the public service that now passes as worship. Today I want to break down what worship is. My goal is that you would be able to say, coming out of this, this is what biblical worship is. And then to be able to know what you need to do to prepare your experience and experience biblical worship. That is the section that I wasn't able to get to in the first service and maybe won't be able to get to, but I will bring it back. We do not see our modern day word worship until about the 30, 13th century. The word actually comes from two words. Worth, which means to ascribe value to something or someone. And then the second word, ship, which is to deliver that value to the person, place, or thing. Our earliest biblical reference to not the modern day word for worship, but the ancient Hebrew word for worship is shaha. Shaha. It means to bow low. It comes from Genesis 18, 2, and it, which says this, Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them, and he bowed low to the ground. He shaha to the ground when he saw them. Abraham recognized that he was in the presence of the divine and he had only one response. And that was to get on his face. As Christians, our perspective or the input that we have gotten most of our lives is that we are the most important thing going on. Me, mine and my life. But when we say that we worship God, we must realize that our worship will always be about the value that we place on God and whether we realize it or not, what we think of God. Worship is placing value on something and, and delivering on that value. It's why John Piper uh, said this, well, before I get to that, we worship all kinds of things. And I was, I was thinking about that this morning. Uh, yes, I did, I watched, I, I, I broke my tradition, I watched the Georgia-Texas game. I, I don't watch SEC games much, but I, I, I watched it and I looked at the people and I realized they are worshiping these teams. And if you watch any Sunday afternoon and you see people dressed up, I mean, they dress up, they are, they are dressed up to worship their team. They value it. They place value on it and they deliver it by having season tickets. And, and they are there, rain, shine, sleet, or snow. And, and the reason they are there to do that is because what John Piper says, we were create, worship is what we were created for. We were created to worship. It's just what do you worship? What, what do you worship? He, he goes on, he says, this is the final end of all existence, the worship of God. And God created the universe that it would display the worth of his glory. And he created us that we would reflect it by knowing it and loving it with all of our heart, with all of our soul, mind, and strength, that we would give ourselves over to him. The church needs to build a common vision of what worship is, what she is gathering to do on Sunday, 
and scattering to do on Monday. There are two types of responses to God in worship. The first is the individual response. This is our personal worship. This is prayer and fasting and giving. Matthew 6 in, in the Bible is a, a chapter where Jesus speaks about some of these individual responses. Jesus was a master at perspective shifts to the group he was talking to. Like when he talked about prayer in Matthew 6, he said, when you pray, do not, uh, do not be like the hypocrites, for they, they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. This is, this is Jesus speaking about our individual responses. One of those responses is to pray. And to say, God, you are amazing. And I bring my life before you. The other response is corporate. This is singing. This is, this is corporate singing. This is clapping. This is raising our hands. This is praying together and serving together. Doing life together. We are worshiping God when we do these things. It says in Acts 2, the, the early church, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. That word devoted means steadfast attentiveness. Another word that is used for it is persevered. They persevered. Some of you understand that when you are listening to sermons, right? You persevere through that. Uh-huh. Okay. But corporate worship is when we do these things together. On November 3rd, in just a couple of weeks, we're going to begin a third service. This third service is going to be uh, on Sunday night, once a month, a prayer and healing service. And my hope is, as I've watched Mike and the team begin to design this service and think it through on Sunday evenings, that we would begin each month with a service dedicated and devoted to uh, prayer and healing that we would start each month that way. My hope is that it would raise our understanding with something new. It would shift our perspective if we have gotten into any kind of rut about worship or Sunday morning, uh, that it would shift our perspective as to what God can do among us when we submit to him in worship and prayer, in corporate prayer. When Jesus said, yet a time is coming and has now come when true wor worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, Jesus names the Trinity in John chapter 4, right there. He says, Father, and in spirit, and in truth. The Father, the Spirit, and truth is Jesus Christ. And he is telling us that true worshipers become it true worship becomes the culmination of our life of sacrifices and sins and our shared life together of sacrifices and sins given unhindered to God so here's what i mean by that so on tuesday when you were offended at your workplace and you held your tongue because you were uh, unjustly treated and you held your tongue, that was a sacrifice that you made. When you opened the door on Wednesday for someone coming in from the cold, because it was very cold on Wednesday, and you held the door for them for just a second so they could get in quicker, that was a sacrifice you made. Feels like a little one, but it was a sacrifice. When you, uh, when you, uh, um, when you were going through the drive through this week, and you uh, were given too much change back because they, they gave you too much money. There was a dollar or something stuck under another dollar and you realized they gave me too much change. And you waited to get your food and when the door, the 
door open, you said, here's the money back. You gave me too much. That is a sacrifice that you made. And when you, when you gather up those sacrifices, what worship is, is you bring those sacrifices, those memories of what happened this week, and you go, thank you, God, for allowing me to have that kind of response because the enemy would have me do something completely different on that, on that day. And because of you in my life, I chose and I picked that sacrifice. And then on the other side of it, when you have missed the mark this week and you, you go, wow, that day, that evening, those things, I missed the mark. I said something roughly. I, I, I broke into a conversation when I shouldn't have. I treated someone poorly. And you, you gather those up, sacrifices and sins, and you bring them to worship, and you lay them before the Lord, and you explode in his presence before him with both your sacrifices and, and your sins. And you say, God, I come in thankfulness and I come in confession and repentance before the Lord. That is what worship is. We bring them unhindered to God. It is like gathering kindling. Have you ever started a fire in the woods? You don't start with logs. You start with the small little pieces. You pick up little twigs and you put them in a, in a pile. And, and those are the sacrifices and the sins. And, and then you catch them on fire and they catch on fire. And then you add bigger ones. You bring everything to this house. This is what I am. This is what I've done. This is who I am. And this is how I won victory in your name. And this is how I disgraced your name. And I bring them to you. In other words, our readiness for God consecrates us for the encounter with him. How ready are you for worship? Do you even think about Tuesday or Monday or Friday or, or anything? And that, that Sunday is, here's what I did this week. Father, forgive me. Thank you for what I did. Now prepare me for the coming week. Listen to these verses from Exodus. I have, I have been around these verses for a couple of months now. And this is, this is Exodus 19, and, it, and it, is, it is Moses and God interacting about what happened. They came out of Egypt. He led them out of Egypt to the mountain of God, Mount Sinai. And it's one of the greatest moments in history because it still impacts us today. This is how the, the, these freed slaves approached God for the first time. It says this, On the first day of the third month after Isra the Israelites left Egypt, on that very day they came to the desert of Sinai. After they had left Rephidim, they entered the the desert of Sinai, and Israel camped there in the desert in the front, in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel. Now let me just stop there. God is serious about this. Has your mother ever called you by your middle name? <laughs> Daniel Edward? Dan, that's a different thing. Daniel Edward, right? Say your middle names all at once. Well, that was interesting. <laughs> God is saying to Moses, the people, the, the people of Jacob, the descendants of Jacob, the people of Israel, he is trying to let Moses know, I want your attention here. I am calling on the descendants of Jacob and the people of Israel. He used both the names. 
You yourselves have seen what I did in Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. He got his attention and then he said this. I want you to remember. I want you to remember what I did. Remember, I got you out of Egypt and I brought you on eagle's wings. Remember what I did. So many of us come in here and we have completely forgotten what we did on Thursday afternoon. But if you muster it, if you begin to live that way, if you begin to live toward worship as if worship is the day of accounting and it's the day of preparation. It's a day where you go, what happened this week to me? Oh my goodness and oh my goodness sacrifices and sins brought before the Lord. Then he goes on to say this. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. What God is doing here with Moses is he's making an offer. He's offering them him something. He's saying, if you keep my commands, this is the way it's going to go. I'm going to, I'm going to make you into my people. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So Moses went back and summons the elders of the people and set before them all the words the Lord had commanded him to speak. The people all responded together. We will do everything the Lord has said. The phrase there in Hebrew means this, without a dissenting voice. I want you to picture our country right now. Just think of America. Is there any issue that we could bring before all Americans right now that, there, that our response would be without a dissenting voice? Everyone would say, yes! Anybody? I can't even fathom that in our country today. But in this moment, in Scripture, the entire nation of Israel said with one voice, without a dissenting voice, we will do everything the Lord has said. They, they are... What they are saying is they are preparing themselves to meet the Lord. By the way, right here, I just want to say this. In a couple of weeks, it is time to vote. We need to get out and vote. No matter which way you vote, we need to do that for our country. We must. Then he goes on to say, the Lord said to Moses, I am going to come to you in a dense cloud so that the people will hear me speaking with you and will always put their trust in you. Then Moses told the Lord what the people said. Of course he did. He said, you know, they are with you, God. Then, and the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. In essence, get them ready. Get them ready. Have them wash their clothes to be ready by the third day because on that day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Put limits on the people around the mountain and tell them, be careful that you not approach the mountain or touch it uh, or touch the foot of it. Whoever touches the mountain to, will be, is to be put to death. He was serious about this. They are, not, they are to be stoned or shot with arrows. Not a hand is to be laid on them. No person or animal shall be permitted to live. Only when the ram's horn sounds a long blast may they approach the mountain. After Moses had gone down the mountain to the people, he consecrated them and it, they washed their clothes. Then he said to the people, Prepare yourselves for the third day. Abstain from sexual relations on the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain. 
and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. When Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it with fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled. As the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. And the people heard it. It wasn't, it wasn't an effect. It wasn't, he, oh, there's God because he opened the, the, the Red Sea. There's God because there was a plague brought on the Egyptians. Those are all effects of God's presence. God was descended on the mountain. Moses spoke and God answered him. And the people heard the voice of God. It was in that moment in history that all the things that had been said through Abraham up through Moses now were confirmed by the people. They heard the voice that Abraham had heard. They heard the voice that Jacob had heard, that Israel had heard, that Moses had heard. All the people heard the voice. God is the honored guest at worship, not you and not me. God is the honored guest. And, and as we as we move into this series, I'm going to ask you, how are you preparing? How do you prepare for worship when you come through these doors? These doors are just like any other doors in society. They're doors that open and they're doors that shut. You come into a building that has lights and heat, but this is a different place because we are a gathered people And we're gathering together to hear the voice of God. But we have to prepare. Are you prepared? Let's pray. Heavenly Father. Following you is not just about doing good things. And the Israelites, Lord, were working that out, trying to figure that out. Because good people would have rushed that mountain and been killed. But it was, but God was setting apart for himself a people that were attentive to his voice. That would respond when his trumpet sounded and not before. Heavenly Father, make us into those people. Even more personally, for the woman who's listening to me, for the man who's listening to me, have them say in their heart, make me into that person. And then corporately, may we say without a dissenting voice, Lord, We will do anything. We will do everything that you say. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.